scary. Um, right, thank you. I'm not going to be able to follow your steps there. Um, can you hear me? All right. So I just push. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, it all started back 2007, just down the road, where we had a little hole in the wall. And um, you know, I had that five minutes, huh? It takes five minutes to settle in. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's where it happened. Um, but let me go even further back to where I started. I uh, grew up in Pretoria, don't laugh, and um, studied at the Swiss Hotel School in Randburg in Joburg, and then came down to Cape Town in 1999, where I got a job at the Sellers Home Nort under the guidance of Chef George Jardine. Um, that was Nobelli at the Cellars at the time with Christoph Nobelli, good mates with Marco Pierre White. Um, yeah, I was hot kitchen chef for a while, and then um, a position in the pastry kitchen came available, and I thought, well, why not? Let's do it. So I went across to the pastry, and I loved it. And after about a year, the, the head pastry chef left, and they offered me the position of head pastry chef, which I wasn't ready for. And I wasn't ready just to teach myself either. Didn't have that self determination then. And um, so I decided best to leave and get more experience somewhere else. And I got a job at the Table Bay Hotel at the Vina Waterfront. There I was in charge of the a la carte desserts, uh, dinner desserts. And that was a really great experience as well. Um, but in hotels, you're just reading a number. So it's not really so you know, nurturing. Um, at that time, probably about a year or so after there, I jumped around a lot. Um, the Arabella Sheraton Grand Hotel was open at the, what's that, that CCTCCB thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I got a call, they were headhunting, and they said, come across, we'd like you to be part of the normal team for setting up the hotel. Um, I said, yep, I'll try it out. So we did, we set up the hotel, and I was there for about six months. It was not great. I didn't enjoy it at all. Uh, for a number of reasons, I won't get into those now, because I've only got 20 minutes to talk. Um, in the meantime, I had applied for the Cunard chips for the Kiwi 2, which was pretty cool. I mean, she's the oldest, well, was the oldest ocean liner in the world. Um, she was born in 1968. And she was still the fastest ocean liner. Um, the Aries bought her, and now she's a, a floating hotel in Dubai. Um, so yeah, that was a great experience. Um, we went around the whole world, did a world cruise, from New York all the way around the world to um, Southampton. I never had July 31st. That day was completely dis disappeared. It was really weird. Um, and I was doing a la carte dessert for 1,900 passengers. Every day. We worked seven days a week, 16 hours a day, for four months, and then we got one month off. Um, and I didn't want to do a la carte for 1,900 people anymore, so I worked my way pretty quickly up to the Queen's Grove, which only served 50 guests, the VIP elite 50 guests. So to give you an idea, the ship is 78,000 tons, and it had nine turbo diesel engines, of which Two were always being serviced, so it was like they were rotating the whole time. But each guest, their ticket, paid for the entire fuel bill of the boat to go around the entire world, plus tender ports, because she was an ocean liner, so she has a huge deep hull, so she can't dock in most ports, so then they dock all the lifeboats, and those go back and forth all day. So one ticket cost the entire fuel bill of that ship. So food was obviously no budget, and we just created and ate foie gras and ate caviar. Because on the ships, you have time control fridges and temperature control fridges, and if anything's been sitting out for more than four hours, it's got to get thrown away. So we were the bins. <laughs> <laughs> um, where was I? The ships, yes. So then I did two stints. The second stint was Mediterranean and the Norwegian fjords. That was amazing, the boat went through the fjords. Um, we were in Lisbon every two weeks, so it got boring. But yeah, it was great. Um, drank a lot, ate a lot, saw a lot, worked a lot. Uh, came back in 2004, and then I got a phone call from a friend of mine who 
was the F&B manager at Sellers back in the day, and he was opening up the hotel in Pizzula at Neisner, or in Neisner at Pizzula, Resort to Talent Spa, which back then was a great six-star hotel, now apparently it's fighting for liquidation, which is sad. Um, so they said, Jay, come up, we've got a place for you in Neisner, we want you to be head pastry chef. I said, Neisner, no eggs. <laughs> and they said, no, but he's a great chef. I said, well, who is he? He says, uh, Jeffrey Murray, an American chef. I said, American? No ways. I said, come. <laughs> so, so I went. Uh, they, they paid for my weekend, which was nice. And uh, I ended up signing, up, signing and moving there for three and a half years. Um, during that time, I, was, I learned a lot. I learned, Jeffrey basically taught me everything I know with, um, oh. <laughs> Oh, it's terrible, and it's snorted as well. <laughs> um, integrity and uh, respecting the product. I don't know why I want to try. Um, yeah, that was amazing. So, and then I learned, I met Marcus from Real Japan, who also inspired me to bake. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Like I said, I don't talk, I just really bake and shout at my stuff. Um, <laughs> but that's where my love and my passion came from. Uh, in Eisner, and um, that was incredible. And uh, just to see him bake, and you know, baking for me in the beginning was just throwing flour and yeast and water and salt together, and that was it. And you made a dough, and that was it. And there was no science behind it, which there's a huge science behind it and uh, an integrity in the product and in what you're doing. So, yeah. Um, so Marcus was there, I learned. Um, I did a two-day break course with his mentor, and that's when Henry was born. My Henry is my best staff member ever. <laughs> Henry doesn't talk back. Henry's never late for work. <laughs> so Henry is a sourdough starter. Basically, he is just flour and water mixed together, and then a wild yeast strain comes in and he ferments. So even after one day, it will start fermenting. And three days later, a bacteria called Lactobacillia joins the mix, and that forms a little symbiotic relationship where they just brew together and they make happy bread. You can pass it around, you can taste it if you want as well, but smell the acidity. So that lactic acid build up in there is what makes sourdough such an incredible bread. It's also the, the fact that we ferment our bread for 60 hours and the acidity in the bread breaks down the gluten, so it's almost pre-digested before you get it. So if you are gluten intolerant, a sourdough is a good way to go. If you're diabetic, a sourdough is a good way to go because it's also low GI. And the reason why most people are gluten intolerant in this country is because we've only really had great breads for the last 20 years since Marcus started baking in Iceland <laughs> and since I started baking in Cape Town 10 <laughs> So, you know, we've been fed with a lot of bullshit, a lot of bad bread. Um, yeah, I pulled myself together now again, thank God. <laughs> um, all right, I was in Isla for three and a half years, um, and I decided it's time to come home, back to Cape Town. I put the word out, and then George Jardine, who was at the Cellars, my head chef at the Cellars, phoned me up. So the Cellars definitely played a big role in all of this. Um, and said, Jay, I'm opening up a bakery. I've got a restaurant in Cape Town called Jardine Restaurant. Uh, would you like to open up a bakery? So I was like, well, I haven't got a clue how to bake, but I've done a two-day bread course, so let's do it. Um, <laughs> and I uh, said, but I don't want to work for you, I want to work with you. So we became partners. I moved back in June of 2007. Uh, yeah, June of 2007. And basically, we had a little garage that was a garage back there. Um, everybody know where that hatch is? All right, so that was a little garage, and I had a one single little deck oven to be paid 4,000 rand for that I got it off for some auction, and a little mixer, which I still have today, which I paid 2,000 rand for, uh, off of, also of auction, and I baked every day, and I just practiced every day from June, we only opened in August, um, and then when I wasn't baking, I was working upstairs on the grill at Jardine Restaurant, because they needed some talent up there as well. And, um, one day I was making baguettes, and 
Marcus walked by. And Marcus said to me, hey, Jay, how's it going? He says, cool. He said, can I roll over with you? I said, yeah, please, let's go for it. So we made some baguettes, and then while they were proving, he just he left and went shopping, and he came back, and by that time I had baked them, and they were cooling off. And he said to me, shall we try them? So I was like, yeah, okay. So he gave me some pointers of some things that I did wrong, and blah, blah, blah. So and we break, broke the bread, and um, no pun intended, and uh, he said, this is good dough. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I just continued doing what I was doing, and eventually we opened up the shop. Um, but three, three months after we opened, he came by again. He was having dinner upstairs, and then the next morning he came by and tasted the, the rye bread, and said to me, oh, I missed that part. That's a good part. <laughs> when I left, nice Marcus told me I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God this is not being graded. I would have been... <laughs> um, he told me I was an idiot. He said, why do you want to leave and why do you want to bake? So I said, he said, you don't even know how to bake. He said, I guess it's like me becoming a blacksmith. I was like, well, why would you want to become a blacksmith? He says, exactly. I have no clue how to become a blacksmith. <laughs> you don't know how to bake. So I said, well, I'm going to teach myself. And I did. Um, did you emotional get? <laughs> and so when he came down and he said, Jay, I was wrong. You can bake. Your bread is amazing. I give my bread 90%, I give yours 80. That was I. Yes, we opened on the 20th of August 2007. The first day Cape Town got good bread. Um, it was a very simple menu. It was, it was six of us in the hatch. Oh, we keep going back to those days. Um, <laughs> We made sandwiches, we made bread sandwiches. We still have a couple of bread of those bread sandwiches on the menu today, I've never been able to take them off. Uh, we make kick ass pies. Teasers used to be on the corner. <laughs> and I used to on my blackboard say, my pie or our pies are better than theirs. <laughs> um, now, social media art cry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was great about Instagram back then, huh? You do what you want. Um, yeah, so the menu was small. The sandwiches, it was pies. We did our, our croissants. We did a plain croissant, which I make more classic, because it's definitely not plain. Uh, an omelette croissant, a bacon croissant. We did the pan chocolat, and we did the cranberry lanish. We did pastel bananas. Pastel bananas, if you will. So that's what you guys ate. Did everybody eat one? You said thank you, Jason Bakery. Thank you. <laughs> I'm forgetting about my slides. Why is it not changing? Where am I? Oh, you haven't even been looking at that one. Okay, you can see that. There we go. So those are my baguettes, and the ones in the baskets are the sour. We don't bake them in the baskets. The baskets are used to allow the bread to prove, and it's too heavy, can't sustain its own weight, so it locks into the grooves as it climbs. Then you flip them upside down and bake them. Um, yeah, so it was a small menu, it was a great menu, and it definitely put us on the map. I mean, we were working our butts off, but we had fun. We were at, up at four, I well, no, was at work at four in the morning, uh, we left at five or six in the evening, um, we had a lot of fun, and we did um, hot cross buns. Well, no, you can't see that one. We did hot cross buns for Easter, and we started off making like 12 on the Wednesday, and by the Saturday on the first Easter, we had done like 900. It was crazy. Um, on the top left, those are our um, carrot cake, the cheesecake truffles. And then at the bottom are, are almond croissants, pre-baked, pre-baked. Um, yeah, and then we made grandma's, cheese, grandma's Christmas cake and grandma's brownies. So grandma's still around. Yeah. She should actually be here today, but anyway. She is here. I mean, she's still around. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's 90. And um, a lot of my recipes come from her. Again. Yeah, um, yeah she's also. Awesome. Um, so grandma's chocolate chip brownies 
and her uh, Christmas cake, which now is fucking making it for 11 years as legendary. Um, yeah, we saw hundreds, hundreds. We started them already. Last week we started making them. So we matured them for six months. By the time you get them, which you will be getting, or not getting, you'll be buying. Um, <laughs> 150 back, 150, no, what, 150, 160 of them? We made 200. And that's my sister. Um, and then this year, or last year, Hennessy actually got in touch with us and wanted us to do a Hennessy cake. We did 24 limited edition Hennessy cakes. Oh yeah, quickly, that's the pastels de nada. And there's our croissants with no bullshit. And these babies. Stone ground flour, farm butter, three day process. It takes us three days to make our croissants. Whereas if you look at a supermarket croissant, it probably takes close on one hour to make 15,000. My guys are almost there. You're almost there. <laughs> NEC cake. So that's so our, 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 our normal cakes get um, either Wellington, BO, or uh, Clippies. Depends. Um, and this was with a basically they had a bottle of NEC in them. That was the packaging for last year, but it's taken us 11 years to get there for them to recognize us. Bastards. Um, yeah, so back then I was rolling out croissants with a, that's the old hatch, um, rolling out croissants with a rolling pin in front of my deck oven at 240 degrees. So I had to roll it super quickly before the butter um, melted out the croissant. Uh, yeah, it was all hand rolled with rolling pins. So only two years later could I afford a dough sheet which allowed us to um, laminate a lot quicker and a lot more efficiently. Um, in 2013, no, like 2011, thanks, B. 2011, uh, Jardine Bakery closed down. Cape Town was more concerned about the bakery closing down and the, the loss of the baking croissant than they were about the restaurant. Just my partner's off. I'm happy about that. Um, and so we took over. Bridget joined me as my business partner. And definitely we wouldn't be where we are today without her. That's what I can show. I would have uh, spent all my money. Um, as you can see there, that's the, that's the old menu board. That was the menu in its entirety on the board. Um, but now with the new space, sorry B, that's only for that big fun of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was before the shop. I still looked okay. Um, we opened. We took over most of the space, and we opened up uh, Jason Bakery, which um, has been incredible. The little hole in the wall has turned into a restaurant that basically showcases the breads and pastries that we make. Um, you, I wouldn't really call it a bakery anymore, but we're hanging on to that. But it's definitely become a full-blown restaurant, um, which is incredible. That's really gone from strength to strength, and we're super lucky. Um, but we work, we work hard at it, so it's definitely not all just luck. We work our butts off. Um, so I digress. I mean, so I've got a strict position. All right. So the original idea of, of, of the restaurant was that we actually wanted to run it like the hatch but with inside seating. We didn't want waiters, we didn't want breakfast, we didn't want lunch. We wanted to run like, like that. Nope. Nope, like that. But with inside seating. But it wasn't long before we had sit down seating, we had waiters, we had breakfast, we had lunch, and we had ceramic coffee cups. <laughs> um, then, we decided to open Saturday. So also the step part is that we didn't open Saturdays and Sundays back then. Eleven years ago, town was dead. There was no one around. Um, there was no one in Bree Street. There was no one in Bree Street, particularly, what? yes. So we closed weekends, we closed um, public holidays. We used to almost take three weeks in December. The good old days. Um, so we, op we opened on Saturdays and we wanted to bring back the old hatch vibe. So we opened it from the hatch. And we didn't do breakfast, we didn't do lunch, we just did pastries. Uh, and a couple of sandwiches, which was great. Um, and then, sorry, I'm going to rain all of a sudden. 
Dominic Ansel, in 2013, in May 2013, launched the Cronut, which everyone went before about. Um, and it's the croissant donut hybrid. Basically, it's croissant dough shaped like a donut and deep fried. And he, I mean, people queued for it for it was a media sensation. He won best pastry chef of the world, and uh, people queued for hours and hours and hours and to get these things. And I think they still do. Um, I was there well in 2015, and I got in quite quickly. I wasn't blown away, but anyway. So it went mad, and all the copycats jumped in, and I was one of them. And uh, we launched ours in June, so we gave him a month breather. Um, <laughs> We did ours slightly differently. It took us a while to get the feel of it. We decided we're going to bake ours, and instead of piping it, we're going to cut them in half and fill them. And pretty much we learned pretty quickly how to do it. And we just grown and grown and grown on them. Um, we, he does a flavor a month, we do a flavor a week. These are available daily, mine's only available on a Saturday. He posts what his flavor is before the month. We only post what our flavor is 8 o'clock in the morning on the day. <laughs> now we've got clever, it's not good business sense. So now we actually send you a teaser on a Tuesday. <laughs> so you can pre-order and I'll make more money. Um, so that top one on the left, that is a salted caramel and chocolate fudge dosant with a fudge crumble. And then that's cut in half, and then there was a newspaper article on it at the bottom. And then the other one was a new on chocolate fudge. Chocolate cells. So just the chocolate and salted caramel all day, it would be great. Then we decided to start deep frying them. And then we did different, uh, well, we always do different flavors. And we did, that one was a bit freaky for people, the full party. <laughs> <laughs> But the salted caramel Jack Daniels one was a hit. And then um, the next one is how it's evolved into kind of what we're doing today. Um, so we don't cut them in half anymore, we pipe them, uh, and we just make them fucking amazing. Those are our Instagram. I didn't have a slide for my Instagram, so just copy that. So that's the two, that's mine and it's JC Bakery. Um, one's a, uh, a Crack pie, because it does like to taste like crack. I wouldn't know, apparently. <laughs> the other one was a waffle stack, which is amazing. So, the, those signs have definitely evolved. We've done over 230 flavors. Tom's only done, what, 40, 45? Um, we've never repeated the flavor, uh, except for the top 10. We did the top 10, where people, uh, customers got to vote what the top 10, what their top 10 was, and then what well, we did the top 20, and then we narrowed it down to a top 10. My one wasn't in there, that's a bit upset. The Elvis Presley is amazing. <laughs> anyway, back to, back to the, um, the shop. We did some amazing evenings and events as well. So we would uh, do, on Thursday nights, we did pizza night, way before first Thursdays, um, where we did <coughs> pizzas and beats. That was our old logo at the bottom. It was my signature, I thought it was cool in the day. <laughs> and um, we, we had a DJ, and then eventually uh, Martini came on board, they heard about us, and they jumped on, and they sponsored all our drinks. Um, and we did sourdough pizzas, and we named them off the motorcycles, like the cafe racer, the popper, the cruiser, the hog. And we had rockabilly events, we had guys putting up in their V8s, so we had motorbikes everywhere. It was a great, great, great evening. But we forgot that we had to wake up at 4 in the morning the next morning. So, it was short-lived. Uh, and then we forgot about the 4 o'clock in the morning thing again, and we did tapas nights. After I came back from Spain and was inspired to do tapas. And that too got out of hand. Um, and we were closing shop at 2 and getting up at 4. So, that one didn't last long either. Well, it lasted a while until we went out. And then we forgot all about it again and decided to do Urban Picnics, which was quite a cool collab with us and Frankie Finn and Meat Merchants, where we did Urban Picnics. And we used old wooden tomato boxes to put your picnic in, and you got meats and you got jams and chutneys and you got our bread and 
didn't get any views. And yeah. um, you could sit outside on the tables, and you could sit in the island in the middle of the street. You could sit anywhere you wanted, and it was quite a cool vibe as well. And also then, 4 o'clock came. <laughs> so we stopped that. So what we decided to do was lunchtime events. So we did Lobster Tail Fridays, which was rad until lobsters ended up on the red list. So most of the time we ended up selling 80 lobsters, 80 lobster rolls a day on a Friday. If we did it every day, we wouldn't have sold one. But because it became a thing, it was only once a month, people were rushing to get there. And it was great. And eventually we became an institution. And you find us everywhere. I've got some people coming here after us. I didn't bring a hundred, but I've got a few. You might have to fight. Um, so, yeah, beyond cars. Um, the red one was the original one when I was at Jardy. It was red. And then we changed it to gold. Um, it's called Camilla. Uh, weekends were red. So we've got a flapjack stack and a wild, wild west. So weekends we played, but we still managed to hold on to the, the whole, um, am I going over my time? Am I right? I'm going to be looking at it. I'm carried away. Um, weekends we create, we play. So it's not, the, it's not the weekday menu. It's all about creativity, about having fun, still focus on pastry, and allowing our staff to also be creative and not just do the, the Monday to Friday stuff. And in about 2015, we did a rebranding. The dear friend of mine, Bruno Morfitt, or the real Bruno, please stand up. I'm not standing up. Eh? <laughs> he didn't like my signature, he said it sucked. <laughs> so we sat down and did a rebranding, and because I like bikes, this is a bit of a mix of a, of, of, uh, like a Holly Davidson bar and shield, and a pirate skull and crossbones, apparently because I'm a bit of a rebel, <laughs> quote unquote. And um, yeah, so that's what the brand is now today, which is much better. And also, we had the croissant and we had the Jason. So we brought the two together and merged them together. We also did some really, really cool t-shirts. pre rebrand Killer croissants. You won't, it's like, this is like the dough song. You won't let me reprint a t-shirt. So it's one sort. And then the dough will die. That's the latest one. That's cool. I don't know why he wrapped carrots in string though. <laughs> <laughs> then, last year we opened this bad boy up, which was amazing. It's the restaurant and bakery den that I've always wanted. Um, Here we've got big ass ovens and an even bigger dough sheeter and it's not extreme baking. We used to get up in the morning, get there for four and the baker was sitting at 34 degrees. And you have to try and laminate and bake and get everything done before 10 and it's just sweating the water off. And it was horrible. This is now the Amada ship. Nothing, not to take anything away from the baby over there. Um, this is the interior, again Bruno on the walls. Um, that's our fridge with the peep show, seating, and then I've got a, we've got a great team of bakers um, who are now baking right now while I'm talking to you, which is fantastic. So we uh, opened the Greenpoint, we moved all the baking out of the little hatch, and we bake at Greenpoint, and we sent up to Brie. Um, the croissant dough we make at Greenpoint, we send to Brie, and we still make the croissants at Brie. So Brie still makes we still got a pastry kitchen and pastry chefs there, and we still make a lot of our stuff there, but all the breads and doughs are made at Greenpoint, and it's shipped up in our super pimped out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is rare, and on the back doors it says dangerous pastries. <laughs> and I've given a few guys the flip when I'm driving it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's us. I mean, there's another bit of our products, our eggies, which became super famous, uh, which evolved from just chorizo eggies to um, sun-dried tomato eggies and uh, Norwegian salmon eggies. We do, we do use Norwegian salmon, smoked salmon, not salmon trout. 
um, Boston cream pie, and a Bakewell tart. And then our new baby, which is our midnight bagel with activated charcoal. Uh, so quick pickled uh, cucumbers and miso mayo, uh, miso cream cheese, which is amazing. But really what makes us different is that we bake today for today. <laughs> yeah. I can see it, speak it. We bake today for today. We don't put any bullshit in our products. We don't have preservatives, we don't use premixes. Premixes would be a dry version of Henry thrown into a bag where everything's mixed up together. You don't have to think, you just throw it in the machine and you whip it on speed two and bob your uncle. Um, there's no chemicals in our products, so it's just in our bread, it's flour, water, salt, <coughs> yeast, or Henry, and love, five, sorry, five. Um, and we base everything on our, our ethos is integrity, honesty, quality and consistency. And that's how we've been around for 11 years. Um, yeah, there's a lot of places that are opening and closing left, right, and center. And I think it's just studio guns. It's what happens, a lot of hard work and a lot of integrity. And then the backup of the family. And the great team. <laughs> great business partner. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the support from our loved ones Makes it easy when you get home after 12 hours of work, seven days a week, which we've been pulling both now because of open Sundays. It's incredible. And there's some, um, I think it's, oh, what's it, um, <laughs> narcissistic photos. <laughs> uh, Paul Smith, Paul Hollywood, sorry, Paul Smith, yeah, he did Paul Hollywood at the bottom there. Uh, when he came out and we did a dose on together, uh, he's a famous British baker. Uh, did that great British Bake Off, so he came and spent the day with us, which was incredible. Uh, top one, I was a guest judge, I looked pretty good back then, uh, at uh, Top Chef. And then Mr. DJ Fresh popped in for a morning of croissants and talked some shit. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's us, in a nutshell. Thank you.